Hi everybody, this is Anjanette from AJ's Personal Touch. How y'all doing? I hope you're doing great. This is Saturday. It's 8.21 p.m. I meant to get on here earlier. Let me tell you, it's been a day. Um, I woke up with a really bad migraine, so I had to go back to sleep knowing that I was going out today with a good friend who used to live around here and moved away. She got married, moved away. She's now back. I was so excited to get to see her. So I woke up with a migraine, took my meds, went back to sleep, slept until I had just enough time to get a shower and get ready to go. And we went to Starbucks. We sat and talked and it was hours. We sat outside, it was in the 50s, and I dressed for it, but ended up freezing at the end. So we sat out there until I was literally freezing, and then I was like, I got to go. Unfortunately, she's allergic to cats, so she's fine if they're not up in her face. I found the best place for her to sit in the house where they're not at the most. Um, which right now actually happens to be my spot right here because even though Kalua is over here with me every day and sometimes I get one of the others, they are always converged on my husband on his chair. All except Kalua. Kalua will not jump in his lap. Never has. And I don't know if it's because she's a mama's girl. I don't know. But anyway, um, so I had her sit over here knowing there wouldn't be as much dander. And uh, yeah, we got to talk for a little bit and we left and went to Starbucks, like I said. And I can't wait to spend more time with her. I doubt she ever comes on here, but if you are on here, know that I had a wonderful time today. Absolutely wonderful. Um, she promised that she's gonna come back and we're gonna spend more time together which thrills me because I don't know, I'm here by myself a lot. So that just honestly thrills me to pieces. That, and I've had two sales out of my um, stitch marker group. So I'm thrilled about that. Um, I know you guys may be held back a little bit by the fact that I'm not on Etsy. I don't have my own webpage yet in order um, for payment. You have to let me know which ones you want, but I have to add them up, add tax, and then um, add postage after I know what you want so that I can get packaging and everything together and weigh it so that I can figure out what postage to use. And I do use pirate ships so that I get a discounted postage. Um, I try to give you guys the best price that I can. And... Uh, then I give you the price and then you can pay me. So I know it takes a little bit longer than just pressing a button that says, you know, add to cart and then pay. It's a personalized way right now, but it's what I have. I am looking into websites. I do need to start a blog. Um, I've been looking for a while. I just can't afford a pay site right now. So, um, so yeah, I'm hoping if this takes off and everything, then I can afford to get site and um, set up on there and it will make it much much easier. I've already done my first custom order which I was excited to do and just to remind you guys if you are looking for anything special like um, somebody asked me to look for pugs and Frenchies. I don't know if I'll be able to find them but I will look for them. Um, if you are looking for anything let me know. Somebody asked me to look for gnomes. I have some new Numb charms that came in. I will be showing um, what I have. They are kind of big, but I couldn't find small ones. The only small ones I could find were these 3D silver ones that looked like they were all kind of matched together. And you had to look at it really close to know that it was a no. That's not what I want for you guys. I want something that you'll like and you'll love. Now, I do have a friend who does resin who works with resin and he was buying those little ones so that he can make a mold out of them and we're going to see how that turns out and we're talking about him doing like clear resin with glitter in it so it'd be a solid gnome 
not painted, so you can't see each individual little thing, but just a solid gnome with um, glitter in it. If it turns out, I will show them as soon as I can get them. If they do not turn out, then you guys won't be seeing them. So I'm hoping that they turn out and you can tell it's a gnome. That's what I'm afraid of. I'm, I'm afraid that you're just going to know it's some little pointy hatted thing and not know that it's a gnome. So um, we'll see. By the way, welcome back to my subscribers and welcome into anybody who is new. And I normally don't talk about stuff going on in my channel when I'm getting ready to read. I just weird this time. I guess it's because I haven't been on as much lately. But yeah, I meant to get on here hours ago. I got home oh, around six, actually. So about two, two and a half hours ago. But it's been my day to play catch up with everybody who I haven't seen in a while. And it's been kind of nice. I got a couple texts from people I haven't talked to in a while. And I did try and text a little bit while we were at Starbucks. But I didn't want to be rude to my friend. So I waited when I got home. And I just finally, I was like, I really need to get some reading done and videotaped so if you wouldn't mind i'll be back in a little bit so here i am i cannot wait to get started on the next chapters of anna karenina i have missed it just as much as any of you who have been following which i know at least one of you have and i cannot wait to see i do know there are others of you who are waiting to start this as soon as you have time so I did get my socks made. They are on my feet right now because I came home frozen. I put my jammas on to get nice and comfy. And then I put on my nice thick socks that I made to get my toes nice and warm, which they are in the process of getting there. And now it is time to read Anna Karenina. Are you guys ready? I know I am. I needed one more drink. I'm not used to talking so much. And I did talk quite a bit earlier, so, okay. We are in part two, chapter 13. Levin put on his big boots and for the first time, a cloth jacket instead of his fur cloak. He went out to look after his farm, stepping over streams of water that flashed in the sunshine and dazzled his eyes and treading one minute on ice and the next into sticky mud. Spring is the time of plans and projects, and as he came out into the farmyard, Levin, like a tree in spring that knows not what form will be taken by the young shoots and twigs imprisoned in its swelling buds, hardly knew what undertakings he was going to begin upon now in the farm work that was so dear to him but he felt that he was full of the most splendid plans and projects. First of all, he went to the cattle. Cows had been let out into their paddock, and their smooth sides were already shining with the new sleek spring coats. They basked in the sunshine and lowed to go to the, and lowed to go to, go to the meadow. Levin gazed admiringly at the cows he knew so intimately to the minutest detail of their condition and gave orders for them to be driven out into the meadow and the calves to be let into the paddock. The herdsmen ran gaily to get ready for the meadow. The cowherd girls, picking up their petticoats, ran splashing through the mud with bare legs, still white, not yet brown from the sun waving brushwood in their hands, chasing the calves, and frolicked in the murder of spring. After admiring the young ones of the year, who were particularly fine, the early calves were the size of the peasant's cow, and Pava's daughter, at the three-month-old, was as big as a yearling. Yearling, at three months old, was as big as a yearling. Levin gave orders for a trow to be brought out and for them to be fed in the paddock. It appeared that as the paddock had not been used during the winter, the hurdles made in the autumn for but it appeared that as the paddock had not been used during the winter, 
the hurdles made in the autumn for it were broken. He sent for the carpenter who, according to his orders, ought to have been at work at the thrashing machine. But it appeared that the carpenter was repairing the harrows, which ought to have been repaired before Lent. This was very annoying to Levin. It was annoying to come upon that everlasting slovenly slovenliness in the farm work against which he had been striving with all his might for so many years. The hurdles, as he ascertained, being not his might, being not wanted in winter, had been carried to the cast horse's stable and there broken as they were of light, constru light construction, only meant for folding calves. Moreover, it was apparent also that the harrows and all the agricultural implements which had been directed to be looked over and repaired in the winter, for which very purpose he had hired three carpenters, had not been put into repair, and the harrows were being repaired when they ought to have been harrowing the field. Levin sent for his bailiff, but immediately went off himself to look for him. The bailiff, beaming all over, like everyone that day, in a sheepskin bordered with astrakhan, came out of the barn, twisting a bit of straw in his hands. Why isn't the carpenter at the thrashing machine? Oh, I meant to tell you yesterday, the harrows want repairing. Here it's time they got to work in the fields. But what were they doing in the winter then? But what did you want the carpenter for? Where are the hurdles for the calves' paddock? I ordered them to be got ready. What would you have with those peasants? said the bailiff with a wave of his hand. It's not those peasants, but this bailiff, said Levin, getting angry. Why, what do I keep you for? he cried. But bethinking himself that this would not help matters, he stopped short in the middle of a sentence and merely sighed. Well, what do you say? Can sewing begin? he asked after a pause. Behind Turk and tomorrow or next day they might begin. And the clover? I have sent Vasily and Mishka their sewing, only I don't know if they'll manage to get through. It's so slushy. How many acres? About fifteen. Why not sew all? cried Levin. That they were only sowing the clover on fifteen acres, not on all the forty-five, was still more annoying to him. Clover, as he knew, both from books and from his own experience, never did well except when it was sown as early as possible, almost in the snow, and yet Levin could never get this done. There's no one to send. What would you have with such a set of peasants? Three haven't turned up, and there's Semyon. Well, you should have taken some men from the thatching. And so I have, as it is. Where are the peasants, then? Five are making compost, which meant compost. Four are shifting the oats for fear of a touch of mildew. Konstantin Dmitrovich. Levin knew very well that a touch of mildew meant that his English seed oats were already ruined. Again, they had not done as he had ordered. Why, but I told you during Lent to put in pipes, he cried. Don't put yourself out. We shall get it all done in time. Levin waved his hand angrily, went into the gra granary to glance at the oats, and then to the stable. The oats were not yet spoiled, but the peasants were carrying the oats in spades when they might simply let them slide down into the lower granary, and arranging for this to be done and taking two workmen from their from there for sowing clover. Levin got over his vexation with the bailiff. Indeed, it was such a lovely day that one could not be angry. Ignat, he called to the coachman, who with his sleeves tucked up was washing the carriage wheels. Saddle me. Which, sir? Well, let it be Kulpik. Yes, sir. While they were saddling his horse, Levin again called up the bailiff who was hanging about in sight to make it up with him, and began talking to him about the spring operations before them and his plans for the farm. The wagons were to begin carting manure earlier, earlier so as to get all done before the early mowing, and the plowing of the further land to go on without a break 
so as to let it ripen lying fallow, and the mowing to be all done by hired labor, not on half profits. The bailiff listened attentively and obviously made an effort to approve of his employer's projects, but still he had that look Levin knew so well that always irritated him, a look of hopelessness and despondency. That look said, that's all very well, but as God wills. Nothing mortified Levin so much as that tone, but it was the tone common to all the bailiffs he had ever had. They had all taken up that attitude to his plans, and so now he was not ang angered by it, but mortified, and felt all the more roused to struggle against this, as it seemed. Elemental force continually ranged against him, for which he could find no other expression than as God wills. If we can manage it, Konstantin Dmitrovich said the bailiff, why ever shouldn't you manage it? We positively must have another 15 laborers, and they don't turn up. There were some here today asking 70 rubles for the summer. Levin was silent. Again, he was brought face to face with that opposing force. He knew that however much they tried, they could not hire more than 40, 37 perhaps, or 38 laborers for a reasonable sum. Some 40 had been taken on, and there were no more. But still, he could not help struggling against it. Send to Surrey to check Frivka. To check Farovka. If they don't come, we must look for them. Oh, I'll send to be sure, said Vasily Fedor Fedorovich despondently. But there are the horses, too. They're not good for much. We'll get some more, I know, of course, Levin added, laughing. You always want to do with as little and as poor quality as possible. But this year, I'm not going to let you have things your own way. I'll see to everything myself. Why, I don't think that you take much rest as it is. It tears us up to work under the master's eye. So they're sowing clover behind the Birchdale. I'll go and have a look at them, he said getting on to the little bay cob, Kolpik, who was led up by the coachman. You can't get across the streams, Konstantin Dmitrovich, the coachman shouted. All right, I'll go by the forest. And Levin rode through the slush of the farmyard to the gate and out into the open country, his good little horse after his long inactivity, stepping out gallantly, snorting over the pools and asking, as it were, for guidance. If Levin had felt happy before in the cattle pens and farmyard, he felt happier yet in the open country, swaying rhythmically with the ambling paces of his good little cob, drinking in the warm yet fresh scent of the snow and the air as he rode through his forest over the crumbling wasted snow, still left in parts and covered with dissolving tracks. He rejoiced over every tree with the moss reviving on its bark and the buds swelling on its shoots. When he came out of the forest in the immense plain before him, his grass field stretched in an unbroken carpet of green, without one bare place or swamp only spotted here and there in the hollows with patches of melting snow. He was not put out of temper, even by the sight of the peasants, horses and colts trampling down his young grass. He told the peasant he met to drive them out, nor by the sarcastic and stupid reply of the peasant Ipat whom he met on the way, and asked, Well, I bet, shall we soon be sowing? We must get the plowing done first, Konstantin Dmitrovich answered Ipat. The further he rode, the happier he became, and plans for the land rose to his mind, each better than the last, to plant all his fields with hedges along the southern borders, so that the snow should not lie under them, to divide them up into six fields of arable and three of pasture and hay, to build a cattle yard at the further end of the estate and to dig a pond and to construct movable pens for the cattle as a means of manuring the land, and then 800 acres of wheat, 300 of potatoes, and 400 of clover, and not one acre exhausted. Absorbed in such dreams, carefully keeping his horse by the hedges so as not to trample his young crops, he rode up to the laborers who had been sent to sow clover. 
The cart with seed in it was standing, not at the edge, but in the middle of the crop, and the winter corn had been torn up by the wheels and trampled by the horse. Both the laborers were sitting in the hedge, probably smoking a pipe together. The earth in the cart which, with which the seed was mixed was not crushed to powder, but crusted together or adhering in clods. Seeing the master, the laborer Vasily, went towards the cart while Meshach while Mishka set to work sewing. This was not as it should be, but with laborers, Levin seldom lost his temper. When Vasily came up, Levin told him to lead the horse to the hedge. It's all right, sir. It'll spring up again, responded Vasily. Please don't argue, said Levin, but do as you're told. Yes, sir, answered Vasily, and he took the horse's head. What a sewing, Constantine Dmitrievich, he said, hesitating. First rate. Only it's a work to get about. You drag a ton of earth on your shoes. Why is it you have earth that's not sifted, said Levin. Well, we crumpled it up, answered Vasily, taking up some seed and rolling the earth in his palms. Vasily was not to blame for their having filled up his cart with unsifted earth, but still it was annoying. Levin had more than one already tried away he knew for sifting his anger for stifling his anger and turning all that seemed dark right again, and he tried that way now. He watched how Mishka strode along, swinging the huge clods of earth that clung to each foot, and getting off his horse, he took the sieve from Vasily and started sewing himself. Where did you stop? Vasily pointed to the mark with his foot, and Levin went forward as best he could, scattering the seed on the land. Walking was as difficult as on a bog, and by the time Levin had ended the row, he was in a great heat, and he stopped and gave up the sieve to Vasily. Well, master, when summer's here, mind you don't scold me for these rows, said Vasily. Eh, said Levin cheerily, already feeling the effect of his method. Why, you'll see in the summertime, it'll look different. Looky where I sowed last spring. How I did work at it. I do my best, Konstantin Dmitrievich. You see, as I would for my own father, I don't like bad work myself, nor would I let another man do it. What's good for the master's good for us, too. To look out yonder now, said Vasily, pointing, it does one's heart good. It's a lovely spring, Vasily. Why, it's a spring such as the old men don't remember the like of. I was up home, an old man up there was has sown wheat, too, about an acre of it. He was saying you wouldn't know it from rye. Have you been sowing wheat long? Why, sir, it was you taught us the year before last. You gave me two measures. We sold about eight bushels and sowed a, ro sowed a rood. Well, mind you crumble up the clod, said Levin, going towards his horse, and keep an eye on Mishka. And if there's a good crop, you shall have half a ruble for every acre. Humbly thankful. We are very well content, sir, as it is. Levin got on his horse and rode towards the field where was last year's clover and the one which was plowed ready for the spring corn. The crop of clover coming in the stubble was magnificent. It had survived everything and stood up vividly green through the broken stalks of last year's wheat. The horse sank in up to the pasterns and he drew each hoof with a sucking sound out of the half-thawed ground. Over the plowland, riding was utterly impossible. The horse could only keep a foothold where there was ice, and in the thawing furrows he sank deep in at each step. The plowland was in splendid condition. In a couple of days it would be fit for harrowing and sowing. Everything was capital. Everything was cheering. Levin rode back across the streams, hoping the water would have gone down, and he did in fact get across and startled two ducks. There must be snipe too, he thought, and just as he reached the turning homewards, he met the forest keeper, who confirmed his theory about the snipe. Levin went home at a trot so as to have time to eat his dinner and get his gun ready for the evening. Chapter 4. No, sorry, chapter 14. I am not reading my Roman numerals too well today. Sorry for that. 
As he rode up to the house in the happiest frame of mind, Levin heard the bell ring and the sight of the principal entrance of the house. Yes, at someone from the railway station, he thought. Just the time to be here from the Moscow train. Who could it be? Well, if it's Brother Nikolay, he did say, maybe I'll go to the waters or maybe I'll come down to you. He felt dismayed and vexed for the first minute that his brother Nikolay's presence should come to disturb his happy mood of spring. But he felt ashamed of the feeling, and at once he opened, as it were, the arms of his soul, and with a softened feeling of joy and expectation, now he hoped with all his heart that it was his brother. He pricked up his horse, and riding out from behind the acacias, he saw a hired three-horse sledge from the railway station, and a gentleman in a fur coat. It was not his brother. Oh, if it were only some nice person one could talk to a little, he thought. Ah, cried Levin joyfully, flinging up both his hands. Here's a delightful visitor. Ah, how glad I am to see you, he shouted, recognizing Stefan Arkadyevich. I shall find out for certain whether she's married or when she's going to be married, he thought. And on that delicious spring day, he felt that the thought of her did not hurt him at all. Well, you didn't expect me, eh? said Stepan Arkadyevitch, getting out of the sledge, splashing with mud on the bridge of his nose, on his cheek, and on his eyebrows, but radiant with health and good spirits. I've come to see you in the first place, he said, embracing and kissing him, to have some stand shooting second, and to sell the forest at Ergashovo third. Delightful. What a spring we're having. However did you get along in a sledge? In a car, it would have been worse still, Konstantin Dmitrovich answered the driver, who knew him. Well, I'm very, very glad to see you, said Levin, with a genuine smile of childlike delight. Levin led his friend to the room set apart for visitors, where Stepan Arkadyevitch things were carried also. A bag, a gun and case, and a satchel for cigars, leaving him there to watch and change his clothes. Levin went off to the counting house to speak about the plowing and clover. Agafia Mihailovna, always very anxious for the credit of the house, met him in the hall with inquiries about dinner. Do just as you like, only let it be as soon as possible, he said, and went to the bailiff. Oof. When he came back, Stefan Arkadyevich, washed and combed, came out of the room with a beaming smile, and they went upstairs together. Well, I am glad I managed to get away to you. Now I shall understand what the mysterious business is that you are always absorbed in, so cheerful, said Stefan Arkadyevich, forgetting that it was not always spring and fine weather like that day. And your nurse is simply charming. A pretty maid in an apron might be even more agreeable, perhaps, but for your severe monastic style, it does very well. Stepan Argadevich told him many interesting pieces of news. Especially interesting to Levin was the news that his brother, Sergei Ivanovich, was intending to pay him a visit in the summer. Not one word st did Stepan Argadevich say in reference to Kitty and the Shklitbaskis. He merely gave him greetings from his wife. Levin was grateful to him for his delicacy and was very glad of his visitor. As always happened with him during his solitude, a mass of ideas and feelings had been accumulating within him, which he could not communicate to those about him. And now he poured out upon Stepan Arkadyevich his poetic joy in the spring and his failures and plans for the land and his thoughts and criticisms on the books he had been reading, and the idea of his own book, the basis of which really was, though he was unaware of it himself, a criticism of the old books on agriculture. Stefan Arkadyevich, always charming, understanding everything at the slightest reference, was particularly charming on this visit, and Levin noticed in him a special tenderness, as it were, and a new tone of respect that flattered him. The efforts of Agafia Mihailovna and the cook that the dinner should be particularly good only added in the two famished friends attacking the preliminary course, eating a great deal of bread and butter, 
salt, goose, and salted mushrooms, and in Levin's finally ordering the soup to be served without the accompaniment of little pies, with which the cook had particularly meant to impress their visitor. But though Stepan Arkadyevich was accustomed to very different dinners, he thought everything excellent. The herb brandy and the bread of the butter, and above all, the salt goose and the mushrooms, and the nettle soup, and the chicken in white sauce, and the white Crimean wine. Everything was superb and delicious. Splendid, splendid, he said, lighting a fat cigar after the roast. I feel as if coming to you I had landed on a peaceful shore after the noise and jolting of a steamer. And so you maintain that the laborer himself is an element to be studied and to regulate the choice of methods in agriculture. Of course, I'm an ignorant outsider, but I should fancy theory and its application will have its influence on the laborer too. Yes, but wait a bit. I'm not talking of political economy. I'm talking of the science of agriculture. It ought to be like the natural sciences and to observe given phenomena and the labor and the economic ethnographical. At that instant, Agafia Mihalovna came in with jam. Oh, Agafia Mihalovna. Mihalovna, said Stepan Arkadyevich, kissing the tips of his plump fingers. What salt goose? What herb brandy? What do you think? Isn't it time to start, Kostya, he added. Levin looked out of the window at the sun sinking behind the bare treetops of the forest. Yes, it's time, he said. Kuzma, get ready the trap. And he ran downstairs. Stepan Arkadyevich, going down, carefully took the canvas cover off his varnished gun case with his own hands and opening it, began to get ready his expensive new fashion gun. Kuzma, who already scented a big tip, never left Stepan Arkadyevich's side and put on him both his stockings and boots, a task which Stepan Arkadyevich readily left him. Kostya, give orders that if the merchant Raya Benin comes. I told him to come today. He's to be brought in and to wait for me. Why do you mean to say you're selling the forest to Raya Benin? Yes. Do you know him? To be sure I do. I have had to do business with him, positively and conclusively. Stepan Arkadyevich laughed. Positively and conclusively were the merchant's favorite words. Yes, it's wonderfully funny the way he talks. She knows where her master's going, he added, patting Laska, who hung about Levin, whining and licking his hands, his boots, and his gun. The trap was already at the steps when they went out. I told them to bring the trap round, or would you rather walk? No, we'd better drive, said Stefan Arkadyevich, getting into the trap. He sat down, tucked the tiger skin rug round him, and lighted a cigar. How is it you don't smoke? A cigar is a sort of thing, not exactly a pleasure, but the crown an outward sign of pleasure. Come, this is life. How splendid it is. This is how I should like to live. Why, who prevents you, said Levin, smiling. No, you're a lucky man. You've got everything you like. You like horses, and you have them. Dogs, you have them. Shooting, you have it. Farming, you have it. Perhaps because I rejoice in what I have and don't fret for what I haven't, said Levin, thinking of Kitty. Stefan Arkadyevich comprehended, looked at him, but said nothing. Levin was grateful to Oblonsky for noticing, with his never-failing tact, that he dreaded conversation about the Shkortbatskys, and so saying nothing about them. But now Levin was longing to find out what was tormenting him so, yet he had not the courage to begin. Come, tell me how things are going with you, said Levin, bethinking himself that it was not nice of him to think only of himself. Stepan Arkadyevich's eyes sparkled merrily. You don't admit, I know, that one can be fond of new rolls when one has had one's rations of bread. To your mind, it's a crime. But I don't count life as life without love, he said, taking Levin's question in his own way. What am I to do? I'm made that way, and really, one does so little harm to anyone and gives oneself so much pleasure. 
What? Is there something new then? Queried Levin. Yes, my boy, there is. There, do you see? You know, the type of Ocean's women? Women such as one sees in dreams? Well, these women are some sometimes to be met in reality. If these women are terrible, women, don't you know, is such a subject that however much you study it, it's always perfectly new. Well, then, it would be better not to study it. No, some mathematician has said that enjoyment lies in the search for truth, not in the finding it. Levin listened in silence, and in spite of all the efforts he made, he could not in the least enter into the feelings of his friend and understand his sentiments in charm of studying such women. Chapter 15 The place fixed on for this stand shooting was not far above a stream in the little aspen cope. On reaching the cops, Levin got out of the trap and led Oblonsky to the corner of a mossy, swampy glade, already quite free from snow. He went back himself to a double birch tree on the other side, and leaning his gun on the fork of the dead lower branch, he took off his full overcoat, fastened his belt again, and worked his arms to see if they were free. Gray old Vasca, who had followed them, sat down warily opposite him and picked up her ears. The sun was setting behind a thick forest, and in the glow of sunset, the birch trees dotted about in the aspen copes stood out clearly with their hanging twigs and their buds swollen amongst buds swollen almost to bursting. From the thickest parts of the copse, where the, where the snow still remained, came the faint sound of narrow winding threads of water running away. Tiny birds twittered and now and then fluttered from tree to tree. In the pause of complete stillness, there came the rustle of last year's leaves, stirred by the thawing of the earth and the growth of the grass. Imagine, one can hear and see the grass growing, Levin said to himself, noticing a wet slate-colored aspen leaf moving beside a blade of young grass. He stood, listened, and gazed sometimes down at the wet, mossy ground, sometimes at Laska, listening all alert, sometimes at the sea of bare treetops that stretched on the slope below him, sometimes at the darkening sky covered with white streaks of cloud. A hawk flew high over a forest far away with a slow sweep of its wings. Another flew with exactly the same motion in the same direction and vanished. The birds twittered more and more loudly and busily in the thicket. An owl hooted not far off in Alaska started stepping cautiously a few steps forward and putting her head on one side, began to listen intently. Beyond the stream was heard the cuckoo. Twice she uttered her usual cuckoo call and then gave a hoarse, hurried call and broke down. Imagine the cuckoo already, said Stefan Arkadyevich, coming out from behind a bush. Yes, I hear it, answered Levin, reluctantly breaking the stillness with his voice, which sounded disagreeable to himself. Now it's coming. Stefan Arkadyevich's figure again went behind the bush, and Levin saw nothing but the bright flash of a match, followed by the red glow and blue smoke of a cigarette. Tick, tick, came the snapping sound of Stefan Arkadyevich cocking his gun. What's that cry? asked Oblonsky, drawing Levin's attention to a prolonged cry, as though a colt were winning in a high voice in play. Oh, don't you know it? That's the hair. But enough talking. Listen, it's flying. Almost shrieked Levin, cocking his gun. They heard a shrill whistle in the distance, and the exact time, so well known to the sportsman, two seconds later, another, a third, and after the third whistle, the hoarse, guttural cry could be heard. Levin looked about him right and to left, and there, just facing him against the dusky blue sky above the confused mass of tendered shoots of the aspens, he saw the flying bird. It was flying straight towards him, the guttural cry, and like the even tearing of some strong stuff, sounded close to his ear. 
the long beak and neck of the bird could be seen, and at the very instant when Levin was taking aim, behind the bush where Oblonsky stood, there was a flash of red lightning. The bird dropped like an arrow and the darted, then darted upwards again. Again came the red flash and the sound of a blow, and fluttering its wing as though trying to keep up in the air, the bird halted, stopped, still an instant, and fell with a heavy splash in the slushy ground. Can I have missed it? shouted Stepan Arkadyevich, who could not see for the smoke. Here it is, said Levin, pointing to Laska, who, with one ear raised, wagging the end of her shaggy tail, came slowly back as though she would prolong the pleasure, and as it were smiling, brought the dead bird to her master. Well, I'm glad you were successful, said Levin who at the same time had a sense of envy that he had not succeeded in shooting the snipe. It was a bad shot from the right barrel, responded Stepan Arkadyevich, loading his gun. Shh, it's flying. The shrill whistles rapidly following one another were heard again. Two snipe playing and chasing one another and only whistling, not crying, flew straight at the very heads of the sportsmen. There was the report of four shots and like swallows, the snipe turned swift somersaults in the air and vanished from sight. The stand shooting was capital. Stepan Arkadyevich shot two more birds and Levin two, of which one was not found. It began to get dark. Venus bright and silvery shone with her soft light low down in the west behind the birch trees, and high up in the east twinkled the red lights of Arcturus, over his head, Levin made out the stars of the great bear and lost them again. The snipe had ceased flying, but Levin resolved to stay a little longer till Venus, which he saw below a branch of birch, should be above it, and the stars of the great bear should be perfectly plain. Venus had riven above the branch, and the car of the great bear with its shaft was now all plainly visible against the dark blue sky, yet still he waited. Isn't it time to go home, said Stepan Arkadyevich? It's quite still now in the cups, in the cops, and not a bird was stirring. Let's stay a little while, answered Levin. As you like. They were standing now about 15 paces from one another. Steva, said Levin unexpectedly, how is it you don't tell me whether your sister-in-law's married yet or when she's going to be? Levin felt so resolute and serene that no answer he fancied could affect him, but he had never dreamed of what Stefan Arkadyevich replied. She's never thought of being married and isn't thinking of it, but she's very ill and the doctors have sent her abroad. They're positively afraid she may not live. What? cried Levin. Very ill. What is wrong with her? How has she... While they were saying this, Laska, with ears pricked up, was looking upwards in the sky and reproachfully at them. They have chosen a time to talk, she was thinking. It's on the wing. Here it is. Yes, it is. They'll miss it, thought Laska. But at that very instant, both suddenly heard a shrill whistle, which, as it were, smote on their ears, and both suddenly seized their guns. And two flashes gleamed, and two bangs sounded at the very same instant. The snipe flying high above instantly folded its wings and fell into the thicket, bending down the delicate shoots. Splendid together, cried Levin, and he ran with Laska into the thicket to look for the snipe. Oh, yes, what was it that was unpleasant, he wondered. Yes, Kitty's ill. Well, it can't be helped. I'm very sorry, he thought. She's found it. Isn't she a clever thing, he said, taking the warm bird from Laska's mouth and packing it into the almost full game bag. I've got it, Steva, he shouted. Chapter 16 <clears throat> On the way home, Levin asked all details of Kitty's illness and the Shklopatsky's plans, and though he would have been ashamed to admit it, he was pleased as to what he heard. He was pleased that there was still hope and still more pleased that she should be suffering who had made him suffer so much. But when Stefan Arkadyevich began to speak of the causes of Kitty's illness and mentioned Vronsky's name, Levin cut him short. I have no right whatever to know family matters and to tell the truth, no interest in them either. Stefan Arkadyevich smiled hardly perceptibly, catching the instantaneous change he knew so well in Levin's face. 
which had become as gloomy as it had been bright a minute before. Have you quite settled about the forest with Ryabinin? asked Levin. Yes, it's settled. The price is magnificent. Thirty-eight thousand. Eight straight away and the rest in six years. I've been bothering about it for ever so long. No one would give more. Then you, you've as good as given away your forest for nothing, said Levin gloomily. How do you mean for nothing, said Stefan Arkadyevich with a good-humored smile, knowing that nothing would be right in Levin's eyes now? Because the forest is worth at least a hundred and fifty rubles, the acre answered Levin. Oh, these farmers, said Stefan Arkadyevich playfully, your tone of contempt for us poor townsfolk. But when it comes to business, we do it better than anyone. I assure you, I have reckoned it all out, he said, and the forest is fetching a very good price. So much so that I'm afraid of this fellow's crying off, in fact. You know, it's not timber, said Stefan Arkadyevich, hoping by the distinction to convince Levin completely of the unfairness of his doubts and it won't run to more than 25 yards of faggots per acre, and he's given me at the rate of 70 rubles the acre. Levin smiled contemptuously. I know, he thought. That fashion not only in him, but in all city people who, after being twice in 10 years in the country, pick up two or three phrases and use them in season and out of season, firmly persuaded that they knew all about it. Timber run to so many yards the acre, he says those words without understanding them himself. I wouldn't attempt to teach you what you write about in your office, he said, and if need arose, I should come to you to ask about it. But you're so positive you know all the lore of the forest. It's difficult. Have you counted the trees? How count the trees? said Stefan Arkadyevich, laughing, still trying to draw his friend out of his ill temper. Count the sands of the sea, numbers of the stars, some higher power might do it. Oh, well, the higher power of Briabinin can. Not a single merchant ever buys a forest without counting the trees, unless they get it given them for nothing, as you're doing now. I know your forest. I go there every year shooting, and your forest worth a hundred and fifty rubles. In fact, you're making him a present of 30,000. Come, don't let your imagination run away with you, said Stefan Arkadyevich piteously. Why was it none would give it then? Why, because he has an understanding with the merchants. He's bought them off. I've had to do with all of them. I know them. They're not merchants, you know. They're spec speculators. He wouldn't look at a bargain that gave him 10-15% profit, but he holds back to buy a ruble's worth of 20 kopecks. Well, enough of it. You're out of temper. Not the least, said Levin gloomily, as they drove up to the house. At the steps there stood a trap tightly covered with iron and leather with a sleek horse tightly harnessed with the broad collared straps. In the trap sat the chubby, tightly belted clerk who served Ryab Ryabinin as coachman. Ryabinin himself was already in the house and met the friends in the hall. Ryabinin was a tall, thinnish, middle-aged man with mustache and a projecting clean-shaven chin and prominent, muddy-looking eyes. He was dressed in a long-skirted blue coat with buttons below the waist at the back and wore his boots wrinkled over the ankles and straight over the calf, <clears throat> with big galoshes drawn over them. He rubbed his face with his handkerchief, and wrapping round him his coat, which sat extremely well as it was, he greeted them with a smile, holding out his hand to Stefan Arkadyevich as though he wanted to catch something. So here you are, said Stefan Arkadyevich, giving him his hand. That's capital. I did not venture to disregard your excellency's commands, though the road was extremely bad. I positively walked the whole way, but I am here at my time. Konstantin Dmitrievich, my retrospects, he turned to Levin, trying to seize his hand too. But Levin, scowling, made as though he did not notice his hand and took out the snipe 
your honors have been diverting yourselves with the chase. What kind of bird may it be, pray? What kind of bird may it be, pray? Added the Rabinin, Rabinin, looking contemptuously at the snipe. <clears throat> A great delicacy, I suppose. And he shook his head disapprovingly as though he had grave doubts whether this name were worth the candle. Would you like to go into my study, Levin said in French to Stefan Arkadevich, scowling morosely. Go into my study. You can talk there. <clears throat> Quite so, where you please, said Rabinin, with contemptuous dignity, as though wishing to make it felt that others might be in difficulties as how to behave but that he could never be in any difficulty about anything. On entering the study, Ray Benin took about as his habit was, as though seeking the holy picture, but when he had found it, he did not cross himself. He scanned the bookcases and bookshelves, and with the same dubious air with which he had regarded the snipe, he smiled contemptuously and shook his head disapprovingly, as though by no means willing to allow that this game were worth the candle. Have you brought the money? asked Oblonsky. Sit down. Oh, don't trouble about the money. I've come to see you to talk it over. What is there to talk over? But do sit down. I don't mind if I do, said Rayabinin, sitting down and leaning his elbows on the back of his chair in a position of the most intense discomfort to himself. You must knock it down a bit, Prince. It would be too bad. The money is ready con conclusively to the last farthing. As to paying the money down, there'll be no hitch there. <clears throat> Levin, who had meanwhile been putting his gun away in the cupboard, was just going out of the door, but catching the merchant's words, he stopped. Why, you've got the forest for nothing as it is, he said. He came to me too late, or I'd have fixed the price for him. Raya Benin got up, and in silence, with a smile, he looked Levin down and up. Very close about money is Konstantin Dmitrovich, he said with a smile, turning to Stefan Arkadevich. There's positively no dealing with him. I was bargaining for some wheat of him and a pretty price I offered to. Why should I give you my goods for nothing? I didn't pick it up on the ground nor steal it either. Mercy on us. Nowadays, there's no chance at all of stealing. With the open courts and everything done in style, nowadays there's no question of stealing. We are just talking things over like gentlemen. His Excellency's asking too much for the forest. I can't make both ends meet over it. I must ask for a little concession. But if the things, but is the thing settled between you or not? If it's settled, it's useless haggling. But if it's not, said Levin, I'll buy the forest. The smile vanished at once from Rayabinin's face. A hawk-like, greedy, cruel expression was left upon it. With rapid, bony fingers, he unbuttoned his coat, revealing a shirt, bronze waistcoat buttons, and a watch chain, and quickly pulled out a fat old pocketbook. Here you are, the forest is mine, he said, crossing himself quickly and holding out his hand. Take the money. It's my forest. That's Raya Benin's way of doing business. He doesn't haggle over every half penny, he added, scowling and waving the pocketbook. I wouldn't be in a hurry if I were you, said Levin. Come, really, said Oblonsky in surprise. I've given my word, you know. Levin went out of the room, slamming the door. Raya Benin looked towards the door and shook his head with a smile. It's all youthfulness, positively nothing but boyishness. Why, I'm buying it upon my honor. Simply believe me for the glory of it. That Raya Benin and no one else should have bought the co copes of Oblonsky. And as to the prophets, why, I must make what God gives in God's name. If you would kindly sign the title deed. Within an hour, the merchant stroking his big overcoat neatly down and hooking up his jacket with the agreement in his pocket, seated himself in his tightly covered trap and drove homewards. Ugh, these, these gentlefolks, he said to the clerk. They, they're a nice lot. That's so, responded the clerk, handing him the reins 
and buttoning the leather apron, but I can congratulate you on the purchase. Milhal Ignatovich. Well, well. Chapter 17. Stefan Arkadevich went upstairs with his pocket bulging with notes, which the merchant had paid him for three months in advance. The business of the forest was over, the money in his pocket. Their shooting had been excellent, and Stefan Arkadevich was in the happiest frame of mind, so he felt specially anxious to dissipate the ill humor that had come upon Levin. He wanted to finish the day at supper as pleasantly yet as it had be as it had begun. Levin certainly was out of humor, and in spite of all his desire to be affectionate and cordial to his charming visitor, he could not control his mood. The intoxication of news that Kitty was not married had gradually begun to work upon him. Kitty was not married but ill, and ill from love for a man who had slighted her. This slight, as it were, rebounded upon him. Vronsky had slighted her and she had slighted him, Levin. Consequently, Vronsky had the right to despise Levin, and therefore he was his enemy. But all this Levin did not think of. He vaguely felt that there was something in it insulting to him, and he was not angry now at what had disturbed him, but he felt foul of everything that presented itself. The stupid sale of the forest the fraud practiced upon Oblonsky and concluded in his house exasperated him. Well, finished, he said, meeting Stefan Arkadevich upstairs. Would you like supper? Well, I wouldn't say no to it. What an appetite I get in the country. Wonderful. Why didn't you offer Rybin in something? Oh, damn him. Still, how do you treat him, said Oblonsky. You didn't even shake hands with him. Why not shake hands with him? Because I don't shake hands with the waiter, and a waiter is a hundred times better than he is. What? A reactionist you are, really? What about the amalgamation of classes, said Oblonsky? Anyone who likes amalgamating is welcome to it, but it sickens me. You are a regular reactionist, I see. Really, I have never considered what I am. I am Constantin Levin and nothing else. And Constantin Levin, very much out of temper, said Stepan Arkadevich, smiling. Yes, I am out of temper. Do you know why? Because, excuse me, of your stupid sale. Stepan Arkadevich frowned good humoredly, like one who feels himself teased and attacked for no fault of his own. Come, enough about it, he said. When did anybody ever sell anything without being told immediately after the sale? It was worth much more. But when one wants to sell, no one will give anything. No. I see you have a grudge against that unlucky Rybanin. Maybe I have, and do you know why? You'll say again that I'm a reactionist or something other terrible word. But all the same, it does annoy and anger me to see in all, on all sides the impoverishing of the nobility to which I began, and in spite of the amalgamation of classes. I'm glad to belong, and their impoverishment is not due to extravagance. That would not be nothing, living in good style. That's the proper thing for noblemen. It's only the nobles who know how to do it. Now the peasants about us buy land, and I don't mind that. The gentleman does nothing while the peasant works and, su and supplants the idle man. That's as it ought to be. And I'm very glad for the peasant. But I do mind seeing the process of impoverishment from a sort of, I don't know what to call it, innocence. Here, a Polish spectator bought for half its value a magnificent estate from a young lady who lives in Nice. And there, a merchant will get three acres of land worth 10 rubles as security for the loan of one ruble. Here, for no kind of reason, you've made that rascal a present of 30,000 rubles. Well, what should I have done? Counted every tree? 
of course, they must be counted. You didn't count them, but Ryabinin did. Ryabinin's children will have means of livelihood and education while yours maybe will not. Well, you must excuse me, but there's something mean in that, in this counting. We have our business and they have theirs and they must make their profit. Anything, anyway, the thing's done and there's an end of it. And here comes some poached eggs, my favorite dish. And Agafia Milovna will give us that marvelous herb brandy. Stepan Arkadyevich sat down at the table and began joking with Agafia Milhanovna, showing her that it was long since he had tasted such a dinner and such a supper. Well, you do praise it anyway, said Agafia Milhanovna. But Konstantin Dmitrich, give him what you will, a crust of bread. He'll eat it and walk away. The eleven tried to control himself. He was gloomy and silent. He wanted to put one question to Stefan Arkadyevich, but he could not bring himself to the point and could not find the words or the moment in which to put it. Stefan Arkadyevich had gone down to his room undressed again, washed and attired in a nightshirt with goffered frills he had got into bed. But Levin still lingered in his room, talking of various trifling matters and not daring to ask what he wanted to know. How wonderfully they make this soap, he said, gazing at a piece of soap he was handling, which Agafia Milhanovna had put ready for the visitor, but Oblonsky had not used. Only look, why is it a work of art? Yes, everything's brought to such a pitch of perfection nowadays. And Stefan Arkadyevich, with a moist and blissful yawn, the theater, for instance, and entertainments. Ah, he yawned. The electric light everywhere. Ah, yes, the electric light, said Levin. Yes, oh, and where's Vronsky now? He asked suddenly, laying down the soap. Vronsky, said Stefan Arkadyevich, checking his jaw. He's in Petersburg. He left soon after you did, and he's not once been in Moscow since. And do you know, Kostya, I'll tell you the truth, he went on, leaning his elbow on the table and propping on his hand his handsome, ready face, in which his moist, good-natured, sleepy eyes shone like stars. It's your own fault. You took fright at the sight of your rival, but as I told you at the time, I couldn't say which had the better chance. Why didn't you fight it out? I told you at the time that he yawned inwardly without opening his mouth. Does he know or doesn't he that I did make an offer? Levin wondered, gazing at him. Yes, there's something humbugging, diplomatic in his face. And feeling he was blushing, he looked Stefan Arkadyevich straight in the face without speaking. If there was anything on her side at the time, it was nothing but a superficial attraction, pursued Oblonsky. His being such a perfect aristocrat, don't you know, and his future position in society had an influence not with her, but with her mother. Levin scowled. The humiliation of his rejection stung him to the heart as though it were a fresh wound he had only just received, but he was at home and the walls of his home are a support. They say, he began interrupting Oblonsky, you talk of his being an aristocrat, but allow me to ask what it consists in, the aristocracy of Vronsky or of anybody else, besides which I can be looked down upon. You consider Vronsky an aristocrat, but I don't. A man whose father crawled up from nothing all by intrigue, and whose mother, God knows whom she wasn't mixed up with. No, excuse me. But I consider myself aristocratic, and people like me who can point back in the past to three or four honorable generations of their family of the highest degree of breeding, talent, and intellect, of course, that's another matter and never have curried favor with anyone, never depended on anyone for anything, like my father and my grandfather. And I know many such, you think it 
mean of me to count the trees in my forest while you make ripen in a present of 30,000, but you get rents from your lands and I don't know what, while I don't, and so I prize what's come to me from my ancestors or been won by hard work. We are aristocrats and not those who can only exist by favor of the powerful of this world and who can be bought for two pence half penny. Well, but whom are you attacking? I agree with you, said Stefan Arkadevich, sincerely and genially, though he was aware that in the class of those who could be bought for two pence half penny, Levin was reckoning him too. Levin's warmth gave himself genuine pleasure. Whom are you attacking? Though a good deal is not true that you say about Vronsky, but I won't talk about that. I tell you straight out, if I were you, I should go back with me to Moscow and... No, I don't know whether you know it or not, but I don't care. And I tell you, I did make an offer and was rejected. And Katerina Alexandrovna Alex and Alex Alex is nothing new to me but a painful and humiliating reminiscence. Whatever for, what nonsense. But we won't talk about it. Please forgive me. If I've been nasty, said Levin. Now that he had opened his heart, he became as he had been in the morning. You're not angry with me, Sir Steva? Please don't be angry, he said, and smiling, he took his hand. Of course not, not a bit, and no reason to be. I'm glad we've spoken openly, and do you know, standy, stand shooting in the morning is usually good. Why not go? I couldn't sleep the night away, but I might go straight from shooting to the station. Capital. Okay, looks like a good place to stop. There's a bunch of short chapters now, but we've already been at it an hour. Hopefully, I will be able to come back on Sunday and read some more, which, no, today was Saturday. So maybe Monday. Unless I have time tomorrow. I may come back as early as tomorrow. We'll see. The good part, they put other stuff in between. So what do you think? Tell me, do you think that Levin is going to go back and try and get Kitty's hand? I'm hoping he will. Maybe it'll bring her out of being sick. We will see. We'll just have to see what happens. So, same that Kitty really liked Levin and only went after the other one because her mom fancied him. And plus, he was the more handsome out of the two. But it seemed like she really cared a lot for Levin. So... See what happens. We still have three fourths of the book to go. I think I'm about maybe a fourth of the way through. Yeah, maybe about a fourth of the way through. So we will see. And I will see you guys later. Have a great day. Remember, you matter. And remember that you are gorgeous and beautiful and handsome, whichever one you prefer. And I will talk to you later.